Welcome to EDES PCM training series. This volume of the training series will introduce the main characteristics and the design procedure of the software through modeling and analysis of a simple measure building that complies with the limitations of the freeware version. First, let's introduce the user interface of the software. The central area consists of the graphic window, which can be split in two or more viewports. At the bottom we have the command line and some quick commands. The ribbon bar at the top collects most of the commands. They are organized in tabs and groups according to their different function. The navigator on the left allows a quick access to the main views and elements of the project. Also the navigator is organized in tabs which refers to materials, sections and load cases. And finally, the property grid on the right will display the properties of the selected objects. Now, let's start modeling. First of all, we should take care of the stories. By default, there are two stories, the foundation and story 1. In story settings, we have the possibility to add or remove a story, or to modify the properties of the selected story. In this case, we need just one story with a height of 3 meters. We will consider the effect of the wind in the positive and negative x and y direction with the following values of pressure and suction. In the navigator, the active story is the one in bold characters. We can change active story by double clicking on the relevant voice. Now we activate the story 1 because we want to start modeling from this story. We can insert a DXF file to be used as a reference for the modeling of the building. We use the command drawing and we select a DXF file that we already prepared. By pressing the mouse wheel and dragging the mouse, we can apply a pan. As we see, the drawing was placed very close to the origin of the axis, as it was drawn in AutoCAD. Its drawing units are meters, as it's required in EDES PCM. If this was not the case, we could select the object and modify the scale property in the property grid. Here we have also other properties that refers to the visibility, the position, the appearance and the collection of layers. Moreover, if you would like to move the objects, we could use the move command in the tools tab of the ribbon bar. In this case, we are satisfied with the position of the drawing and we can start modeling the structural elements. We go to the model tab. We use the command wall and we define its start point by using the snap offered by the drawing. As we see, we need a wall of a different thickness. Therefore, we can act on the thickness property and change it to 0.4 meters, which is the thickness of this wall. Now we are ready to click on the end point of the wall. We can proceed with the modeling of the next wall by defining its end point. The walls that we modeled in the fourth plan of the building are also available in a 3D view in the next viewport. We can change active viewport simply by clicking inside it and we can use the mouse wheel in order to increase or decrease the zoom. Furthermore, by pressing the Alt key and the left mouse button, we can rotate the 3D view of the model. We can also change the view of the active viewport by acting on the navigator. In this case, the active viewport displays the axonometry, but we can switch to perspective or to the floor plan and come back again to the axonometry. Now let's continue with the walls. We activate the first viewport and we use the command quick wall. This command requires to draw a line that will intersect two lines of the drawing and will create automatically a wall with the correct thickness. We use the command also for the next wall. Now we can press the right button of the mouse to end the command. Now we have to fillet the walls, so we move to the tool tab and we use the command fillet. We select the first wall and the second wall to be filled. We repeat the command by clicking on the right mouse button. Again we select the first wall and the second wall. Again we repeat and we repeat the operation for these two walls. If you remember, the building that we want to model features a gumball roof. So we have to break these two walls in order to define a top offset in the middle. We use the command break, we select the first wall 
and we define a point for the break. We do not need a second point, so we click with the right mouse button. And as we see, the wall was divided into two parts. We repeat the same operation for the other wall. Again, break command, we select the wall, we define the point, and then right click with the mouse button. Now we can model the gable by acting on the top offsets of the walls. We select the first wall and we realize from the arrow that this one is its end point. Therefore, we need to modify the end top offset. We set it equal to 1.2. As we see, we increased the height of the wall at its end section. We repeat the same operation for the other walls. With the ESC key, we deselect the current wall. We select the next one, and from the arrow, we realize that this one is the start point. Therefore, we set the start top offset to 1.2 meters. And we continue with the other walls. Now that we model the walls, let's talk about their materials. If we select this wall, we see that by default the material is existing masonry. This material, as all the others, belongs to the collection of materials available in the materials panel. Here in this list we see all the materials available, and if we click in material settings, we have the possibility to add or remove a material or to change its properties. The properties of a masonry material include modulo elasticity and strengths. This value can be set from a database suggested by the Italian standards depending on the masonry typology. For each masonry typology, a range of values is provided, and we can choose between min, minimum and maximum values, depending on the knowledge level of the building, but we can also set our custom values for each one of the property. Now let's return to the modeling. In the next step, we define the opening in the walls. We use the command opening, and we define the start point and the width of the opening by using the snap offered by the drawing. We confirm the command with the right click. By default, each opening was inserted as a door, but we need two windows, so we select these two openings and we modify the seal property, setting to 1. We modify also the height of the opening, setting to 1 meter. Now we have two windows in that location. Other properties of the opening include the shape, which can be rectangular, elliptical or arch, the net dimension, the definition of the arch and the discretization of the adjacent piers and the strengthenings. Now let's continue with column and beams. The building features a column here in the middle. To define it, we use the command column and we choose a section 300 by 500 millimeters. We define the insert point of the column and we define a rotation of 90 degrees. As for the materials, also the sections belong to a collection available in the navigator. We can activate the panel by clicking on sections and visualize a list of all the sections available. Here we find the sections 300 by 500 mm that we defined for the column. Let's take the chance to define a section to be used for the foundation. We modify this one by setting a width of 600 mm and a height of 300. Now let's define the beam by acting on the beam command. We have to define the start point and the end point of the beam. Also in this case we will use a section 300 by 500 mm. As we see in 3D view, the two ends of the beam must be raised in order to reach the top of the gable. Therefore we select the beam and we act on the property start top offset and end top offset, setting them to 1.2 meters. Also the column must be raised, therefore we select it and we set also for the column the top offset equal to 1.2 meters. Now we are ready to insert the slabs, therefore we move to the 2D view and we activate the slab command. We need to define a point inside the closed area defined by beams and walls. 
for example this region. By default the slab was defined as a flat slab but we actually need a sloped one therefore we select it and we set its typology to sloped slab. Having done so a reference line appears in the drawing it represents the eave line of the slab. We need to bring the reference line in the correct position by acting on the grip points. Please note that this segment represents the upward direction of the slab. Now we can define the pitch value for the sloped slab. Let's do it by trial and error. Let's try first with 30%. It's yet too few. Then we try with 50 and it's the correct value. The function of the slab is to collect the loads and distribute them to the boundary elements, which are the real structural elements. Therefore, in the group load, we have the possibility to define loads for the slab. The value of the first three loads may be defined di directly in the property grid. In fact, we have load 1, which refers to the permanent action, load 2, which refers to the permanent non-structural action, and load 3, which refers to a variable action which can be set in the next property. In this case, we set 2.5 kN per meter square in load 1, 1 in load 2, and then we set 2 kN per meter square in load 3 and we combine it with the, the action snow. Also the load actions belong to a collection available in the navigator in the panel load cases. In this panel we have a list of all the actions and a list of all the load combinations which are provided for the static non-seismic analysis. In this case we have two buttons that uh, allow the modification of uh, actions and combinations. If we click in actions we see the list of all the load actions and uh, selecting one of them we can see that we can modify the combination factors used in the analysis. As for the load combination used in static non-seismic analysis we can uh, see that they will be created automatically when the structural model will be created. They refer to ultimate limit state combinations, serviceability limit state and seismic combination. We can also define custom combination by defining the value of gamma q for all the values of the actions. Now let's go back to the model. Another important property of the slab is the main direction, which is represented by this arrow. It represents the direction where the loads will be distributed. In this case we want to define a different direction by setting an angle of 90 degrees. Now we repeat the same operations also for the second slab. Fine, now that we complete the modeling of story 1, we can take care of the foundations. We activate the story foundation and we select story 1 and activate the property trace. In this way we have a reference of the elements of the upper story. Now we use the beam command, we select the section 600 by 300 that we previously defined and we define the foundation beams by acting on the snaps offered by the drawing. We repeat the command by right clicking. Fine, the model of the building is now completed. Let's go back to story 1 to talk about some other interesting tools. We use the section command and we define a section line. As we see, the section S01 has been defined also in the navigator in the group sections. This layout with viewports aligned vertically is not the only option. Acting on this button, we can change layout by choosing, for example, two viewports aligned horizontally, or three viewports with a main viewport on one side, as in this case, or four viewports of the same size. Now we can activate this viewport and by double clicking on the section S01 we activate the section in this viewport. Let's do the same in the next one. But this time with Alt and the left mouse key we apply a 3D rotation to visualize a 3D section of the building. In this way we created four different views for the building. We can always switch between a single viewport and multi viewports with a double click inside the viewport.
After this, we can pass to the next step of the design by creating the structural model. We act on this button. 